To continue our discussion on the legacy of the late George Cardinal Pell and with analysis of this blockbuster new book by Benedict XVI's former secretary, Archbishop Georg Gonswein, I'm joined by Vatican correspondent for the National Catholic Register, Edward Penton, and Cardinal George Pell's publisher at Ignatius Press, Father Joseph Fessio. Thank you both for being here. Um, I want to jump right in, Father Fessio. Uh, you worked closely with Cardinal Pell for so long. You published the prison journals and other titles. What does the passing of Cardinal Pell mean to you personally and to the Church as a whole? Well, it's a loss of a great friend personally and for the Church as well. Yeah. When Benedict went to his reward, I, did ha I had no sorrow whatsoever. He completed his life. He was on the road to dying. Uh, he was 95 years old. He was ready for the reward. He was going to a place which is far superior to where we are now. And the solemn response for that day, December 31st, was let the heavens rejoice and earth be glad. With Carl Pell was different. Uh, he died on my birthday, which allowed me to say I'm older than he because he's 81, I'm now 82. But I, I believed my I believe he still had part of his mission to accomplish. But my ways are not God's ways. So God decided differently. Yeah. But he was very influential, very active, you know, even in his uh, state where he was, it was hard for him to walk, he, he was not in really good health, but he still had, I thought, work to do. Yeah. But I'm sure that he and Benedict are now rejoicing up there and interceding for us. They see even more clearly than, uh, than they saw when they were here. Yeah. Edward, what was the mood in Rome when the story of uh, Cardinal Pell's passing began to spread. I mean, this was totally unexpected. Yes, I mean, there was a lot of shock, Raymond. I think, uh, I mean, he seemed so alive. I I had dinner with him only a month ago, and he seemed totally fine. He just, he told me he was going for this hip replacement. Um, and so we all knew that was coming. Uh, but he was in otherwise very good spirits, very good health. And so, um, yes, it's come as a great, a great shock to many people. Uh, I want to continue on this, and we, we touched on this a moment ago with Cardinal Mueller. Uh, Cardinal Pell, just before he passed away, he wrote his final column in the UK Spectator. It was just published, and it's a scathing critique of the Synod on Synodality. Uh, Father Fessio, your take on this, and um, it shows you that fighting spirit really never left him, and he was always a man of the written word. He wrote columns when he was archbishop and books. Um, your your take on that and what influence it might have going into the Senate? I, I think that Cardinal Mueller used a good word there, fearless. And I would say, you know, with Jesus, what did you go out to the desert to see? A reed shaken by the wind? Not Cardinal George Pell. He was fair. He had a great sense of humor. But he was honest and clear-sighted and quite intelligent. And so he spoke so clearly but so many of the church have been thinking in their hearts, but have not been able to express as well as he did. So that was one of his great gifts, was to be able to express the, the, the real sense of faith, the real sense of faith of the common people. And he did that in that article, as he did in his other articles. Ed, there is that, we learned this week, that this secret memo or um, the anonymous memo that's been floating around Rome since last Lent, um, it's being attributed now to Cardinal Pell, and it specifically critiques Pope Francis's pontificate, calling it a disaster, catastrophic. Uh, how is this being received, and might that have any influence on the upcoming uh, funeral arrangements for Cardinal Pell? Well, I don't think there's a lot of surprise that it's been revealed as him, because when you read the, the memo, it's a lot of the, in there about the Vatican finances, and it's, we knew it was written by a cardinal, so uh, who knows about uh, Vatican finances in such details as a cardinal, well, it's Cardinal Pell. And so it's not a great shock. But <clears throat> I think, um, yes, I think there's a lot in there, which uh, which also, um, you know, he's he's he would speak about, uh, you know, but in, off the record. I mean, there were things which were a great concern to him, um, things like the, the Pope being silent about, uh, you know, uh, statements being put out by cardinals wanting to change the church's teaching on homosexuality, for example, or, or the German bishops. Um, sort of getting away with what they're getting away with without the Pope saying anything. Uh, the, the, the Pachamama was a great concern of his too. Um, and of course, the lawlessness that's, that's in the Vatican. I mean, that was something that was particularly of concern to him, given 
given the experience he had uh, of, of lawlessness and, and unjust treatment. Um, and he was willing to defend someone like uh, Cardinal Betchu, who, even though he disagreed with him and, and thought him, uh, you know, problematic in terms of Vatican finances, uh, was not treated well and not right. given due process right. by the Pope. And so um, these were all very strong concerns of his, and I think he felt he needed to put it out, yeah. but of course um, wasn't willing to yeah. do so uh, with his name attached. Well, and Ed, you're right. When you read it, it suddenly becomes very clear who's writing it. The um, the financial corruption that he discovered, and you're referencing the four interventions that Pope Francis made into the trial, that financial corruption trial uh, that Cardinal Beshu is, is, is wrapped up in, where he simply waived rules because he was the pope and could do so. And in the estimation of Cardinal Pell, if indeed he wrote this memo, um, it, it was unjust. And there are other things he writes here about uh, the, the, that the church is weaker than it was 50 years ago. The next pope must understand the secret of Christian and Catholic vitality comes from fidelity to the teaching of Christ and Catholic practices. And Father Fezio, he writes this, the Holy Father has little support among seminarians and young priests and wide disaffection exists in the Vatican Curia. What did you think when you read that? Uh, I, I think it's pure speculation as to whether he's the author or not. Uh, he said enough things publicly that we can understand what he, his views were on these things. Uh, I will take a said contra on this. Uh, George Pell was a loyal son of the church. He would not publicly criticize the Holy Father. And I doubt that he would put his signature to something or even anonymously that would be a public criticism. So maybe he wrote it, maybe he didn't, but in a certain sense, it's irrelevant. The question is, is it true? Now, among seminarians, I can tell you from my contact with them and with Fran Meyer and Phil Lawler and others that there are many, many John Paul II seminarians. There are many, many Benedict seminarians. No one has ever discovered yet a Francis seminary. He's, he's not inspired young men to the priesthood so far. Now, that may change. Uh, but uh -huh. certainly there is a uh, disagio, uh, the discomfort with his ambiguity. He says many, many wonderful things. He's never explicitly gone against church teaching, but he always is speaking right. in this ambiguous way, and that, that lends uh, comfort and aid to the enemy, really. So that's a problem. Uh, before I go, I must get your response to this explosive new book by Benedict's former secretary, former head of the papal household, Archbishop Georg Gonswein. It's called Nothing But the Truth, My Life Beside Benedict XVI. Now, it makes some interesting observations about tensions between Pope Francis and the Pope Emeritus. It's currently available only in Italian. We did get a little translation. I will read this to you. Um, Ed, I'm going to ask you to react to this. Uh, Georg Gonswein writes, on the 16th of July, 2021, Benedict XVI discovered, leafing through that afternoon's Lisbatore Romano, the Vatican paper, that Pope Francis had released the motto proprio Traditionis Custodis on the use of the Roman liturgy prior to the 1970 reform. It limited the Latin mass use that Benedict had liberalized. When I asked him for his opinion, he reiterated that the reigning pontiff is responsible for decisions like this and must act according to what he considers to be the good of the church. But on a personal level, he saw it a definite change of course and considered it a mistake as it jeopardized the attempt at pacification that had been made 14 years earlier. Benedict in particular felt it was wrong to prohibit the celebration of mass in the ancient rite in parish churches as it is always dangerous to put a group of faithful in a corner thus making them feel persecuted and inspiring them the feeling of having to safeguard their own identity at all costs in the face of the enemy. Now, uh, Ed Ganswain said in a recent TV interview that reading this broke Benedict's heart. Your reaction and any repercussions in Rome, any reaction in Rome to this? Yes, well, just to, to clarify, I think the German translation was it, it hurt him in the heart. I mean, we don't actually say that, but it wasn't quite as strong as breaking his heart. But it was, at any rate, it was something he was very um, disappointed with, what with and uh, he did think it was a mistake. Um, and he also, the interesting thing is that he, he first of all heard about it in Nosferatu Romano. He never 
he was never notified about it, even though it, it, it supposedly abrogated Simon Pontificum, which was his apostolic letter on this. So, so yes, there, there was that. But um, but I think he he found it. Um, uh, I think Benedict was was surprised by it, and I think um, yes, he he thought it was a mistake. I think the reaction in Rome is that it's it's not really a surprise that he had that reaction. Um, and also, the, I think it says in the book that it remains a mystery why. Uh, the survey that was put out by the Vatican, the CDF, um, to get bishops' opinions on uh, on the um, adoption of Samoran Pontificum in their in their diocese, uh, that's never been disclosed, and I, I think he he wondered why that wasn't the case. Um, what we know is that um, a lot of bishops were either favourable to uh, the traditional mass or were indifferent to it, um, and not many were opposed to it. So. Um, so it it's it's uh, it's it remains a mystery why that why we still why we still haven't seen the results of that survey and and the pope pope benedict seemed to agree with that father fessio it's interesting in that memo that uh, again anonymously written but now attributed to uh, uh, cardinal pell he says the next pope has to normalize the situation with traditional um catholics uh, traditionalists that they should be regularized um did you ever speak to pope benedict about Traditionis custodis. Does that seem no, like an I, accurate take, as Ganswein describes it? Well, yes. I I read <clears throat> Ganswein's book, the, the, the Italian edition that is out. If it is out, I, I read it before it came out. Uh, and there's a lot mm -hmm. of you know papal gossip in there. <clears throat> there's also <clears throat> a very strong critique, I think, unfair of Carlos Serra with respect to that book, from the depth of our heart. But that particular passage which you read. Sinone vero e ben trovato is in Italian. It's not true. It was well created because I'm sure that was Benedict's reaction. But notice how he placed it. He's not going to criticize publicly, but personally, he thinks it's a mistake. He's not speaking as Pope now. He's speaking as Pope Emeritus. And so he's got a right to his opinions on things, but he never wanted to make things public mm -hmm. if it would in any way call into question the authority of the Pope. So Benedict was a, mm -hmm. a humble man, a man of restraint, and this is just another sign. Mm -hmm. Let's move on to Amoris Laetitia and the, the dubia, the questions that those four cardinals posed to Pope Francis about clarification regarding communion for divorced Catholics who were remarried without an annulment. Now, according to Ganswein, Benedict was shocked that Francis declined to answer those cardinals. Ganswein writes, his silence regarding this matter became rigorous, when the dubia letter, which the four cardinals, Walter Brandmuller, Raymond Burke, Carlo Caffara, and Joaquin, uh, Joaquin uh, Meisner, had sent to Pope Francis in September of 2016, was made public, circulating it after they had received no response for a couple of months. None of them ever had a chance to speak to the Pope Emeritus about it, neither at that time nor afterward, when in the spring of 2017, the cardinals returned to the charge and asked Pope Francis for a clarification audience. Benedict was only humanly surprised at the absence of any hint of a reply from the pontiff, despite the fact that Francis normally showed himself willing to meet and talk to anyone. Ed, was Benedict's reaction to the Pope's silence surprising uh, to you or to anyone in the Vatican? I thought what was interesting about this was that um, Benedict never um, had a chance, or the cardinals, the cardinals of the dubia, never had a chance to speak to him about it, um, either, you know, soon after or, or later. Um, and I thought that was quite, quite strange in a way that they were never given that opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, I think, um, I think otherwise it was, it was rather unsurprising that that I would say. Father Fezio, I want to get your take on the passage about Ganswain's own dismissal from the papal household. Now, this is in connection to something you brought up a moment ago, a, a, a foreword that Benedict had written with Cardinal Seurat for his book. Um, quote, after those torrid days of controversy surrounding Cardinal Seurat's book, on Monday the 20th, I asked Pope Francis if I could speak to him. He gave me an appointment for late morning at the end of the audiences. I gave him in detail the details about what had happened and asked his advice on how to act in the future since it was not always easy for me to succeed in preventing problems like the one that had just occurred. He looked at me with a serious expression and said in surprise, from now on, stay at home. Accompany Benedict, who needs you, and become a shield, essentially, to, to the Pope. 
Um, your, your reaction to that, uh, Father Fessio, he said he felt like a halved prefect between the two popes after that episode. Yes, well, I mean, I've known Georg Gensman for quite some time, and he's been somewhat friendly to us in the Nation's Press. He's the one that suggested we do Paul Body's book on Our Lady Guadalupe. Uh, and, mm -hmm. of course, Pope Benedict had a great and high regard for him. But at the same time, uh, there's a curial view here that you have to be careful. Anything which might make it seem as if Benedict was criticizing the Pope. Uh, and so it was... Genswein, who was more concerned about this book, I think, than Benedict was. But the fact is, and we published it in English, it's called From the Death of Our Heart. There is a, there's two main chapters, one entirely written by Benedict, and he told Seurat, you can do whatever you want with it. Second chapter, written by Carl Seurat, and then Seurat drafted the introduction and conclusion using the word we, we this, we that. And he had Benedict mm -hmm. review it, Benedict accepted it, and even made some changes to it. So that book is a co-authored book. It has two authors. It has Pope Benedict and Carlos Seurat. And all this disturbance about, oh, we can't put Benedict's name there. We'll see Mike's criticizing the Pope. Even if we're criticizing the Pope. I mean, are we saying that Paul can't stand up to Peter and criticize him publicly? But it wasn't a criticism of the Pope. It was a defense of the church's teaching on celibacy of the priesthood, which both Carlos Seurat and Pope Benedict holds so dear, and rightly so. It's a jewel. Yeah. It's a crown jewel of the priesthood. Ed, Ed it's clear that uh, Georg Gonswein, Archbishop Gonswein, was in a difficult position, caught between two masters, if you will, um, and he's trying to parse his way through it. I'm more focused on, and the thing that stood out to me was not the book or who wrote what. The real part of this was um, the, the way he was treated by Pope Francis, frankly, on an administrative level, which we have seen again and again. People summarily dismissed, priests, archbishops, bishops with no explanation in South America. That seems to me the more important takeaway from this episode. Yes, it is. And uh, that, that seems to be the way the Pope handles it. He tends to um, not dismiss them totally. They'll keep, he keeps them in position, but gives them nothing to do or or just lets them je slowly just to, to be dismissed. And that's why um, mm -hmm. Archbishop Genswein had to keep coming back to him, saying, well, can I have it my job back? Instead of Pope Francis saying straightforwardly, well, no, you've, you've essentially been sacked. Didn't Benedict even write to Pope Francis asking him to restore uh, Genswein? Yes, he did. He wrote to him, uh, I think, soon after, in, in January 2020, uh, wrote quite a long letter uh, actually begging him to clarify, begging for Francis to clarify the situation about uh, what happened and so that, um, you know, they could go forward. And again, you know, it shows Benedict's willingness to always be unifying and try to find um, common ground and, and bring peace to the situation. We shall leave it there, gentlemen. Thank you both for being here, for your reflections, your insight. Ed Penton, Father Joseph Fessio, thank you so much.